I think we will get started. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, uh, I'm Dr. Aid Mustafa, MC for this function. I would like to welcome you to the afternoon session, uh, the third panel uh, titled U.S. Policy. We have three very capable uh, participants, and I look forward to hearing from each one of them. Moderating this session will be none other than Jihad Abu Slim, who is the executive director of the Jerusalem Fund. He's a PhD candidate in the History and Hebrew and Judaic Studies joint program at NYU. His main area of research is Palestinian and Arab uh, perception of the Zionist project and the Jewish question before 1948. He earned his bachelor's degree in business and Hebrew language, uh, teaching methods from Al-Azhar University in Gaza, Palestine. An accomplished speaker and writer, he combines his passion for history with his commitment to activism and policy changes. Uh, Jihad recently edited the book, Light in Gaza, Writings Born of Fire, published by Haymark Books in 2022. He has been published in Al Jazeera, the Washington Post, Journal of Palestinian Studies, the New Arab, Middle East Eye, uh, and Box, and contributed to the anthology of Gaza as metaphor with a chapter entitled From Fence to Fence, Retelling Gaza Story. Jihad, uh, the panel is in good hands with you at the helm. Uh, please take it. Thank you so much, Dr. Mustafa. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for uh, joining and for those who uh, are sticking with us since the morning. Uh, we appreciate your dedication. Uh, and we value uh, your presence here as part of our conference and as part of this important conversation. We started today's conference uh, by talking about the Nakba in the first panel. The Nakba, not just as an event that is relegated to the past, but as a process that is lived and experienced in the present. And we also uh, talked about uh, the legacy of the Oslo Accords uh, in the second panel, um, and we continue this conversation and we uh, conclude this, this conversation today uh, with uh, this panel that will focus on U.S. policy and the question of Palestine. Um, and I think this is imperative given that we are here in the United States um, and uh, it is important for us to think about the different ways the United States approaches the Palestine question. Initially, the goal of this panel, which uh, which is still uh, the, the very goal of it, is to examine the potential evolution in U.S. policy towards Palestine. Um, and we uh, reached out to the panelists and we asked them to discuss the numerous aspects in U.S. policy vis-a-vis -vis Palestine, including changes in electoral politics, grassroots mobilization, and the contributions of Palestinians and their allies indirecting uh, uh, shifts in U.S. policy on Palestine. And these themes and questions are uh, more relevant these days, especially in light of what's happening in Gaza and beyond. I'm honored today to uh, be joined uh, by three great speakers who are on the front line of advocacy and education work in Washington, D.C. and beyond. I'm going to introduce them, and after that, we are going to hear from uh, the three of them. And uh, before I introduce the speakers, I just would like to remind everyone that if you have any questions uh, or comments, please make sure to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. So uh, let me introduce our speakers first, and then we will hear from them. Uh, we are joined by Aya Ziade, who is the Advocacy Director for Americans for Justice in Palestine, Action, and American Muslims for Palestine. She is a Palestinian-American human rights scholar, advocate, and writer who has a track record in organizing awareness of Palestine and other crucial human rights issues. Aya has over seven years of political and grassroots advocacy and lobbying campaign experience. This experience consists of being a legislative staff, a lobbying intern working closely with the ACLU, and an organizer working with several different organizations and coalitions, providing her, ex providing her with extensive knowledge of all the spaces contributing to policymaking and advocacy. 
Aya has completed her master's in international human rights at the Joseph Corbel School of International Relations. Throughout her graduate experience, she specialized in Palestinian rights, resistance, and the dynamics of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. She has completed an abundance of research and policy work on the issue. We are also joined by Josh Rubner, who is the Director of Government Relations with the Institute for Middle East Understanding, IMEU, and an adjunct lecturer in Justice and Peace Studies at Georgetown University. He is currently finishing his PhD at the Univers University of Exeter's European Center for Palestine Studies, where, he, where his dissertation is entitled A Tragedy of Catastrophic Proportions, the U.S. and the Palestinian Nakba, 1947 to 1950. Rubner is author of Shattered Hopes, Obama's Failure to Broker Israeli-Palestinian Peace, and Israel, Democracy or Apartheid State, uh, question mark. He is a former uh, analyst in, in Middle East Affairs at Congressional Re Research Service. Rubner holds an MA in International Relations from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a BA in Political Science and Eastern Studies from the University of Michigan. And last but not least, we are also joined by Hassan al tayyib who is an author, songwriter, and legislative director for Middle East Policy and Advocacy Organizer at Friends Committee on National Legislation. Hassan leads FCNL's work to end US military involvement in the Saudi-led war on Yemen, advocate for Palestinian human rights, and advance diplomacy with Iran. Hassan was honored by Arab American Foundation as an awardee of its 2022 40 Under 40 initiative for his policy work on Capitol Hill. Prior to joining FCNL, Hassan served as the co-editor of the national advocacy group Just Foreign Policy, where he worked on uh, where he worked to reassert congressional war authority and promote human rights in the Middle East and Latin America. He is frequently invited to guest lecture at colleges and universities around the United States on foreign affairs. His writings and commentaries have been featured in numerous national and international news outlets, including CNN, BBC World News, Politico, The Intercept, and more. This is an incredible panel of speakers, and I am honored to be joining all of them. Um, we are going to start by hearing first from Josh Rubner, Josh, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Jihad. It's really an honor to be part of this really important conference, and I thank you for the opportunity. Since the horrific attacks by Hamas on Israeli civilians on October 7th, which killed an estimated 13 to 1,400 Israelis, Israel has killed more than 11,000 Palestinian people in the Gaza Strip, including more than 4,500 children. There are an estimated 2,700 Palestinian people trapped under the rubble today as we speak, with more than 1,500 of them being children. More than 1.6 million Palestinians have been forcibly displaced from their homes, about 70% of all Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, and more than 50% of all homes in Gaza have been damaged or destroyed by Israel. Now, of course, the clock didn't start on October 7th. We need to wind the clock back at least to 1948, to the original Nakba, to understand today's catastrophe. And I want to note that today we have passed an incredibly grim milestone. Assuming that many of the 2,700 Palestinians who are reported to be trapped under the rubble are dead, as of today, Israel has now killed more Palestinians in a little more than one month than were killed during the entirety of the Nakba in 1948 in 1949, estimated at 12,000 people. I want to repeat that. Within just a little bit more than one month, Israel has killed more Palestinians than it killed during the Nakba in 1948 and 1949. As Palestinians and people around the world draw parallels between the Nakba of 1948 and the catastrophe that we're witnessing today, so too must we draw parallels between US policy toward the Nakba 
under the Truman administration and today's catastrophe under the Biden administration. First, we must of course recognize the very substantial debits accruing to the Truman administration and its policies. The Truman administration supported the UN's partition, partition recommendation of Palestine over the advice of State Department officials who said that partitioning Palestine against the wishes of the indigenous majority Palestinian population was a violation of their self-determination. We have to put on the debit side of the Truman administration its decision to recognize Israel precipitately, despite Israel not meeting any of the conditions for statehood that were laid out by the UN partition recommendation. And we also have to place on the debit side of the scale the Truman administration's failure to expend the political capital that was necessary to reverse Israeli territorial conquests and to reverse Israel's exile of the Palestinian people during the Nakba. But to his credit, however, President Truman never countenanced the forced displacement of Palestinians. President Truman never countenanced Israel's deliberate targeting of Palestinian civilians. President Truman never exported a single weapon to Israel during the Nakba. President Truman supported multiple mandatory ceasefire resolutions in the Security Council. And President Truman's administration supported the UN General Assembly resolution in voting for Resolution 194, which calls for Palestinian refugees right of return. Today, the parallels between what US diplomats are reporting about and warning about are eerily similar to what they reported about and warned about during the Nakba in 1948. In October 1948, the first U.S. envoy to Israel, James McDonald, wrote, quote, the Arab refugee tragedy is rapidly reaching catastrophic proportions and should be treated as a disaster. He based his assessment on 15 years of, quote, personal contact with refugee problems. This is what he wrote. Approaching winter with cold, heavy rains will, it is estimated, kill more than 100,000 old men, women, and children who are shelterless and have little or no food. The situation requires some comprehensive program and immediate action that dramatic and overwhelming calamities as a vast flood or earthquake would invoke. Nothing less will avert horrifying losses. Every consideration of mercy, justice, and expediency called for what McDonald believed was necessary in terms of international efforts to prevent a large scale loss of life. James Keeley, who was the US minister to Syria at the time, agreed with McDonald's assessment. And he wrote, all concerned must continue to work for a just settlement of the Palestine problem, thus eliminating the cause of the disaster for which unlike an earthquake, man, not God, must take the blame. Diplomats, representatives of US humanitarian organizations sent dire reports about the conditions of Palestinian refugees everywhere in 1948. And the conditions were dire everywhere. But you know where they were the most dire? In the Gaza Strip. Nearly 75 years ago to the date of this conference, on November 15th, 1948, R.T. Schaefer, 
who was the director of the American Red Cross relief missions in the Near East, set out on a two week visit to gauge the situation of Palestinian refugees. Schaefer reported that the Gaza area was, quote, the worst. In one camp of 10,000 we visited, there was no tent that did not have patients with dysentery. All were suffering hunger. Compounding the suffering that Schaefer saw in Gaza was the fact that the population of refugees was increasing as a result of ongoing Israeli ethnic cleansing operations that were taking place in the fall of 1948 and that are taking place before our eyes today in November, 2023. Schaefer wrote, quote, Arab villages are still being burned in the Gaza district. I saw them burning, Schaefer testified. And refugees are continuing to pour into the pocket from Gaza to Rafah on the Egyptian border. Egypt, which of course exercised military control over Gaza, was being unhelpful, according to Schaefer. He wrote, quote, Egypt has closed the border, which is heavily guarded, with the result that a sense of bewildered, homeless refugees are congesting the area from Gaza to Khan Yunus to Rafah, with despair on their faces as they watch the smoke from their burning villages mounting into the desert sky. Neither the Egyptian army nor their government was providing any relief. And Schaefer wrote that a UNICEF delivery of 30 tons of rice and tinned meat eight weeks beforehand was totally inadequate. Schaefer wrote that just enough food was distributed to give support to the statement that a distribution was made. And as I read these memorandum from 1948, and I look at the horrifying pictures out of Gaza today, with the incredibly disturbing news that we are now receiving, that Palestinians in the Gaza Strip are dying, not just because of the bombs, not just because of the artillery shells, but also now because of starvation and dehydration. I think to the words of the philosopher George Santayana, who wrote that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We are witnessing a second Nakba today. We are witnessing Israeli genocidal actions against the Palestinian people, to which our government has given the greenest of green lights to conduct. Contrast the Truman administration's policies with the policies that we're seeing today from the Biden administration. When we saw the horrific scenes of Palestinian refugees being bombed in Jabalia, weapons experts noted that those strikes were likely conducted with one ton GBU bombs with joint direct attack munitions attached to them, most likely dropped from F-16 fighter jets. These are all our weapons. These are weapons that we pay for and give to Israel to conduct its genocidal actions against the Palestinian people. The Biden administration has already notified Congress that it wants to send more assault rifles to Israel, more smart 
bomb kits. It wants to transfer to Israel weapons with absolutely no congressional oversight. And the Biden administration has requested $14.3 billion more in weapons to further make the US complicit in these genocidal actions. On the one hand, the Biden administration says that Israel must comply with international humanitarian law. But then on the other hand, the spokesperson of the National Security Council, John Kirby, repeatedly goes on national television and declares that there are no red lines. There are no red lines for Israel. Yesterday, the President of the United States said, quote, that there is no possibility for a ceasefire. And let's talk about forced displacement. The Biden administration did nothing to stop Israel's forced displacement of 1.1 million Palestinians from the northern part of the Gaza Strip. And while he said that he does not support the forced displacement of Palestinians beyond borders, read the fine prints. In the supplemental appropriations request he sent to Congress, he asked for up to $3.5 billion to quote, address potential needs of Gazans fleeing to neighboring countries. He anticipates it, and we know that this is Israel's desire to push Palestinians into the Sinai Peninsula. And I'll end with this. We all know how President Biden famously discounted Palestinian civilian deaths just a few weeks ago. Yet yesterday, Barbara Leaf, the Assistant Secretary of State for Near East Affairs testified before Congress that, quote, referring to civilian fatalities, quote, we think they're very high, frankly, and it could be that they're even higher, even higher than are being cited. This is the level of degree of complicity and knowledge that the Biden administration has and continues to support Israel's genocidal actions. And it must end, and it must end now. Thank you, Josh, for this historical background that, again, we started today by highlighting that the Nakba isn't an event relegated to the past, but a, a process that continues into the present. Um, now we're going to hear from Aya Ziad, the Advocacy Director for Americans for Justice in Palestine Action and American Muslims for Palestine. Aya, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Shihad. Um, obviously the last five weeks have been well first of all i'm really honored to be here today i think it's great for us to be having these discussions continuously um the last five weeks have been obviously incredibly difficult not only as a palestinian uh but as an american as well i think i grew up in america always knowing that i had to humanize myself to the american public along with our government right We've always known where the U.S. stands with its longstanding relationship with Israel, uh, its undying support for Israel and the occupation. But I think I can speak for a lot of people when I say the first two weeks of the situation, seeing the reaction from our government was still shocking, even with the knowledge that we have uh, with its undying support for Israel. And it continues to be shocking when we've been seeing ample proof and evidence of Israel's continued war crimes um, on Palestinians in Gaza. It's uh, war crimes of collective punishment. 
the fact that it's already dropped over 15,000 bombs in only five weeks on the most densely populated area on this planet. Um, the fact that we are the only country amongst barely a handful that stood with Israel and voted no on a UN resolution last week that would have put an end to the violence speaks a lot to the moral compass that is non-existent within our government. But I think what it's shown even more is how now more than ever, our country has been polarized and growingly polarizing over the years, but it's shown now more than ever the mass disconnect between the US government, elected officials and their constituents. Over and over and over for the last five weeks, our elected officials from the Biden administration to members of Congress, to state and local elected officials have shown that they are pledging allegiance to the state of Israel as opposed to the people that fund their salaries, the people that pay taxes. Um, and it's been disturbing to say at the least to see a quote unquote democracy uphold itself on in a way where it's actually representing a foreign government and fighting for the rights of a foreign government to defend itself, aka commit genocide, as opposed to listening to the very people that elect them, the very people that they're supposed to be representing. As it stands today, 66% of Americans are calling for a ceasefire. Collectively, 66% of Americans are calling for a ceasefire. To date, there have been 18 members of Congress that have signed a ceasefire resolution, a very simple ceasefire resolution that literally just calls for a ceasefire. It doesn't talk about the 75 year occupation. It doesn't talk about Israel's longstanding record of breaking every single UN resolution, international law, US law. Uh, it doesn't talk about the fact that Israel is continuously uh, committing settlement expansions within the West Bank defying international law, it literally simply calls for a ceasefire. And 18 members of Congress have signed this resolution. And those 18 members of Congress are all people of color. And I point that out because I think it reflects the fact that our very institution is abhorrently racist and it's proven to be so in the last five weeks. A few days ago, the House voted to censure the only Palestinian American in Congress ever. And they censured her on the basis of saying from the river to the sea. Two days later, the president stood with the our far right uh, members of Congress and condemned this, this saying of from the river to the sea. And I think it just shows how institutionally, no matter who is holding the administration, we have a systematic issue when it comes to the U.S. and its relationship with Israel and how truly, I mean, I think that there is a, a special relationship when it comes to President Biden because he's a self-proclaimed uh, Zionist. He said his, himself that he would create Israel if it didn't exist. Uh, like Josh mentioned before me, He's amplified Israeli propaganda that has not only enabled the genocide of Palestinians within Gaza and the West Bank, but it's heightened uh, Islamophobia, anti-Arab hate, anti-Palestinian hate here in the U.S. I mean, there's been an incident every single week since the president lied and said that he had seen videos of Hamas beheading Israeli children, which has since been debunked not only by international and U.S. media, but by Israeli media themselves. In the last five weeks, we've continuously seen statements come out from our elected officials talking about what happened on October 7th, condemning what happened on October 7th, which is fair. But when you go five weeks strictly condemning one incident while the world is watching a genocide unfold, 10,000 people have been killed. 40% of the death toll has been children. And I don't know if we wanted to be reminded about the fact that, again, Gaza is the most densely populated area on this earth with 2.1 million Palestinians residing in it. 
yesterday I was looking at how the size of Philadelphia, uh, the size of uh, Philly, right? It's, I think, over 140 or 130 miles large. Gaza is smaller than that and has a larger population than there is in the city of uh, Philadelphia. And over 15,000 bombs have been dropped on this small area of which half of its population are children. Our administration continuously spoke about how it can't believe that Hamas would target children. Meanwhile, for the last five weeks, parents have been holding up their dead children in front of cameras to prove to the world what Israel is doing to them. We, myself, Hassan, Josh, we've been working tirelessly on the Hill, trying to understand what kind of gap do we need to bridge for members of Congress to just say the word ceasefire. And we know very well, if we want to be completely honest, we know very well why they refuse to say it. Some of them are either, um, I, I would say half of them are abhorrently racist, Islamophobic, and they've proven so, as we saw them very clearly stated on the House floor the other day when they were hearing the censure resolution against Rashida. Um, we've had our members of Congress saying that Gaza should be turned into a parking lot. We've had members of Congress equate Palestinian civilians and say that we should tread slowly in calling Palestinians innocent civilians and compared us to Nazis. We've had members of Congress literally call for our annihilation and not be condemned for it. And yet the only Palestinian American in Congress is being condemned for it. We've spent five weeks continuously. I mean, thousands of us have shown up to the Hill. Thousands of constituents have been in, in offices. And for the most part, what we're being told is we're having conversations about it. For the last 33 days, 34 days, members of Congress are sitting with their staff having conversations. And I, like my colleagues, continue to challenge these elected officials that are supposed to be representing not only the American public, but have claimed to uphold themselves as the best democracy in the world that upholds human rights. Meanwhile, these very members of Congress are not only enabling and complicit in the genocide against Palestinians, of Palestinians, but they are walking hand in hand with them to date. There have been so many Israeli government officials that in the last week have confidently and comfortably publicly vocalized genocidal rhetoric against Palestinians and have made their mission very clear. And their mission is to annihilate Palestinians. Their mission is to ethnically cleanse pa Palestinians. Uh, the world leaders can continue to have conversations about Hamas as they please. But this, we know very well that this has nothing to do with Hamas. If it had anything to do with Hamas, then Palestinian civilians and the death toll in Gaza would not have reached 10,000. We wouldn't have heard an Israeli government official say that the children of Gaza have brought this upon her, themselves. The children in Gaza have brought this upon themselves. And so I think I speak for almost every American that is right now standing on the right side of history when I say that our government has failed us and failed Palestinians miserably. And this is going to bring upon severe consequences for our government. I mean, we're already seeing the administration fall apart internally. Uh, we're seeing our government, just the dysfunctional nature of it to, to date. Like I mentioned before, I want to remind everybody that 66% of Americans are demanding a ceasefire. Over 71% of Democratic affiliated Americans are against sending any military aid to the state of Israel. And I think that speaks a lot to the mass disconnect between our government and the American public. I want to remind people that the American government is supposed to work for us. We pay our tax dollars, whether we're citizens or not, by the way. If we are anybody living on American soil, we pay tax dollars. 
Meaning not only do we pay the salaries for these elected officials, but our tax dollars are going without our consent to enable the genocide of Palestinians. In the last month, we have seen an unprecedented shift of the American public. For the first time in the history of Palestinian advocacy in the US, we have seen a large shift. The American public is not reflecting the government and vice versa. The American public does not support Israel's occupation of Palestine. The American public does not support our government's stance and its relationship with Israel. We've seen protests, mass protests, the largest protests ever in, for Palestinians was held in DC just a couple days ago with over 300,000 Palestinians, or pro-Palestinians coming out in support and against not only the Israeli government's actions, but the US enablement of Israel. We've seen, I mean, doc, uh, uh, ship workers public, publicly speaking about the fact that they will not work under the conditions of sending shipments of weaponry from the US to Israel. We saw it be successful both in Tacoma, Washington and the Bay Area. Workers and activists successfully um, got in the way of sh more shipment going to Israel and aiding the genocide of Palestinians. Um, with that being said, I am an advocacy director. My full-time job is advocacy. So as a Palestinian and as an American, mm -hmm. I implore everybody that has been taking action for the last five weeks to continue taking action to continue advocating, to continue reaching out to your members of Congress, to your state and local elected officials, because it is working. We have staff themselves telling us from even the most moderate offices that they are getting the highest number of calls and emails they have ever gotten before from our side. For the last 75 years, the Zionist lobby has been so incredibly effective at mobilizing Zionist constituents to be in the ears of staffers and congressional elected officials on a weekly basis, even outside of the current situation, on a weekly basis. And for the first time ever, we are reclaiming that narrative within US government. For the first time ever, we are mobilizing in a, in a grand way that has never been done before. And it has been successful. It's creating a mass shift. Not only are we going to demand a ceasefire, I implore everybody to continue demanding a ceasefire, but once we get a ceasefire, once the indiscriminate bombing stops, we cannot stop this momentum. If we truly want to see the liberation of Palestinians as Americans, we have a duty to continue placing pressure on our government because it's working. We know far too well that President Biden will not be reelected by us in 2024, there will be grave consequences for our government, grave consequences. And we're already seeing, seeing them unfold. Um, and the only way that we can succeed in continuously taking back our narrative is by showing our elected officials cont continuously that we're watching them 24 seven. Um, so again, I urge everybody to continue taking uh, action, pressuring your elected officials on every level and utilize the tools that all of our organizations are making uh, and creating for it to be easy for you to take action. If you truly want to see the liberation of Palestinians, you will not stop even after we achieve our goal um, of getting a ceasefire. Thank you so much, Aya, for this incredible uh, presentation and uh, I'm, I'm grateful for your work, for everybody's efforts uh, on the hill and beyond that are aiming to save lives and protect people's dignity. Uh, we, uh, we, we value your efforts and we appreciate them so much. Um, I would like to remind uh, our valued attendees that if you have any questions for our guests, um, please feel free to uh, send them through the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. I'm sure many of you have a lot of questions about moving forward and the goal of this panel is to inspire action 
and to uh, be an opportunity for all of us to exchange ideas about how we push for change. Um, I'm honored now to welcome my uh, colleague, Hassan al -Tayyib who's uh, the director, the legis legislative director for Middle East Policy and Advocacy Organizer at Friends Committee on National Legislation, FCNL. Hassan has been working for a very long time on the Hill and beyond on matters related to war and peace. And I'm uh, looking forward to hearing from him. Hassan, the floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Jihad, for all that you're doing. I'm really honored to be on this panel. Um, I really have such deep respect for both Aya and Josh and all that they're doing and really honored to be among uh, among them here. Uh, I like everybody here is heartbroken by the violence in Israel and Gaza. I condemn all violence against civilians in Israel Palestine and deeply worry that we're on a path towards even more death destruction and unimaginable suffering right now. And in the face of all this growing violence, we are urging lawmakers and the administration to publicly call for a ceasefire de-escalation and respect for international law. We need to protect lives, those of uh, the civilians all over Palestine, the hostages and the 1 million children that live in Gaza. And we need to address root causes underlying the explosion of violence including decades of institutionalized oppression and collective punishment of Palestinians through a brutal military occupation and blockade. And FCNL is working with IMEU, AJP, uh, and a growing number of organizations, lawmakers, grassroots activists, and international humanitarians calling on Congress to secure an immediate ceasefire and prevent further civilian harm. Some of these stats might um, you know, be familiar to you, but we have passed a grim milestone with over uh, 11,000 Palestinian civilians dead. I fear that that number is far higher than what's being publicly reported. Uh, that 40% are children, thousands of children. Uh, I've heard a, a horrifying stat that we've seen about 20,000 airstrikes in the past five weeks, which is unimaginable if you think about how small a space the Gaza Strip is. And there is no safe place in Gaza right now. And we haven't even begun, you know, I haven't even begun talking about the escalations in the West Bank with over 130 people killed uh, since October 7. And there are hundreds of hostages still missing. So I wanted to dive in and give folks some practical things that they can use with their lawmakers and set the stage for kind of what's happening and what's moving and where we're getting some traction on the Hill as we're having these conversations. Uh, I think maybe folks saw that, you know, the administration has ruled out support, support for a ceasefire, but has called for a 72 hour pause in the fighting. The Israelis then agreed to a four hour uh, humanitarian pause to get in aid. And just this morning, we saw, uh, and I was watching on Al Jazeera, that civilians trying to use that four hour window were attacked with missiles. Uh, and so there is no safe place. These pauses, that's a fallacy. There's, there really is no pause in the violence. When you have children getting surgeries and amputations without uh, anesthesia, when they have third degree burns and no medicine, there is no humanitarian pause. This is a humanitarian nightmare that's growing worse by the day. Now, the, I've heard similar things to what Aya has said, that the mood on the Hill is shifting as a result of our activism, our meaning, you know, you, and so many organizations calling the, the, their phones, uh, you know, flooding their email inboxes, you know, having meetings, going in the media, going in the press, and showing up on the streets and in these rallies, that's working. We need to keep that going. Um, you know, what we've heard is that, you know, people still have the concern about the word ceasefire, but the pressure is working and making it harder. So we have to keep that going. Um, uh, facing pressure from both, uh, from many members of their own staff, as well as the general public, 
the you know the admin you know continues to move the goalposts and that's really important and then cnn recently reported that close advisors to president biden believe that they're only uh weeks not months until rebuffing the pressure on the u.s government to publicly call uh, for a ceasefire becomes untenable again we are uh pushing in the right direction and the the call is growing 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 louder and louder um and so Everybody agrees that there will be a ceasefire. The question is how quickly can it be achieved and how much death and destruction can be avoided? And again, uh, this is not, uh, you know, it's already been repeated uh, several times here, but I'm gonna repeat it again. 80% of Democrats support a ceasefire. That is, that is huge. Another thing is on that same poll, it showed that only 3% of voters strongly uh, oppose a ceasefire. That's another thing to keep in mind. This is a deeply unpopular position that the administration and so many members have taken. Another thing I wanted to mention is that there is an, uh, the Israel supplemental package that people keep hearing about this weapons deal. It's $14.5 billion. It did pass the House last week, uh, but there was an interesting debate there. They have a pay for where they, they said they would take money away from the IRS and then use that to pay for the supplemental, making that bill in particular kind of dead on arrival is one of those rare moments where you saw a majority of Democrats actually opposing aid to Israel. Uh, but there is a, a Senate version that's moving right now that might be attached the, to the continuing resolution or the CR. And that's kind of what we're expecting in the next week or so. Um, and, and I think that would be an absolute disaster to approve that military funding at this point. Uh, you know, we own, we already own it. But at that point, when we, you know, when Biden signs that into law that we approve $14.5 billion to fund this war effort, we own whatever comes next. And that's a, that's horrific. Also, I wanted to flag that the administration is trying to insert a waiver in there to make it almost impossible for Congress to track uh, th how these weapons are being used, how the money is being spent. And so one of the things we're trying to do proactively is to get Congress to strip that waiver out at the very least. And, you know, we oppose the overall bill, but we are trying to attach policy riders uh, to prevent white phosphorus from being used, to make sure that State Department does end use monitoring and Leahy vetting on this funding, to make sure that cluster munitions aren't in there. We are trying, but it's going to be definitely a, a tough road to hope. So who's calling for a ceasefire right now? We have dozens of members, so we have the resolution, and that's that's a solid piece of legislation that we urge that you know every member get on board. That is a small uh, number in comparison to the 535 members on the Hill, uh, but there are other members that have made their own public statements. Um, uh, Rep. McCollum, she put out her own statement calling for a ceasefire. Rep. Maxine Waters, the ranking Democrat on the Financial Services Committee, recently put out her statement. Senator Durbin on, on CNN, I, I think CNN, uh, called for a ceasefire. I, so we are making progress and there is momentum and, and it's not all on uh, that one vehicle that we mentioned earlier. So what we've been asking people to do is Choose, your, choose the way you want to say it. If you want to say it in a statement or tweet on, on the air, co-sponsor the resolution, we're fine with that. We think everybody should get on the resolution, but really we want to keep the drumbeat going and that's huge. Also, hundreds of humanitarian and advocacy organizations have called for a ceasefire. That is just so impressive when you've got, you know, uh, Save the Children, Mercy Corps, Oxfam, uh, you know, and so many other humanitarian operators on the ground, uh, you know, calling for this. And I think that's fantastic. And they're providing some really important leadership on the humanitarian side. But then there are a whole bunch of Jewish, Muslim and Christian groups coming together, calling for this. Uh, and that is real momentum that we need to build on. There are also dozens of other countries, including some lead uh, U.S. allies uh, around the world. Uh, and, you know, we need to listen to their voices. The Jordanians uh, have been pushing for this uh, and, and so many others. So we need to keep that going. 
So uh, I mentioned the Bush to leave resolution that has, you know, 18 sponsors. Right now, there's also a letter being led uh, by reps Pocan, McCollum and AOC. And, and that calls for a ceasefire and it calls for humanitarian aid. And, and I will say that, um, you know, more and more folks are getting on that. I'm really happy with the signer list. It's where, you know, not where we need to be, but new members that have never called for a ceasefire are jumping on that, uh, that resolution. Uh, sorry, um, excuse me, that letter. So we want to keep support and momentum going for that. So when I, when I talk to lawmakers, uh, you know, Jihad and, and several, and Aya and, and Josh, we've been doing these weekly calls and the subset of that group have been lobbying the Hill. Uh, there is more momentum in, in this community, this DC NGO community that I've seen on a lot of issues. So I, I am really inspired by the activism going on. And, and on the Hill, what we're trying to do is make the case for a ceasefire. We make the humanitarian case that a pause is insufficient, a ceasefire is what we need. We make the strategic case. If we don't get a ceasefire, we could see regional escalations that we haven't seen in generations. We just do, we can't afford that. We can't afford a war with Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Iran, uh, potentially, you know, other armed groups in all these, all these areas. So we cannot afford that. So on top of the humanitarian toll, there's this other larger strategic case that's been resonating with people as well. We also talk about the need for a ceasefire to de-escalate the West Bank. When I say ceasefire now, I'm not just talking about Gaza. I'm calling on settlers to stop their attacks on Palestinians all over the West Bank. That is so critical that we can that we keep pounding the pavement on that and not let go of the fact that we need to de-escalate the West Bank. I also say a ceasefire would help get the hostages home. You cannot bring these hostages home without a ceasefire. And, and some are, are saying, you know, we could do a prisoner swap, but they are at risk right now because of the blockade. Are you going to expect Palestinians who, who, you know, don't have water, food, medicine, uh, and medical equipment for their own children, their own friends and family, and expect that they're going to give that last bottle of water to a hostage, we're putting everybody's life at risk right now. So that is another key argument that I found uh, that has resonated with offices. Last, but definitely not least, a ceasefire would help us stem the tide of hate that we're seeing both anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, and anti-Arab racism, which I've personally experienced since October 7. And that is so critical to emphasize as well. This conflict is escalating all sorts of uh, dividing lines among the American population. We saw this poor child get stabbed multiple times by his landlord in Chicago and the mother as well. We're seeing other attacks on uh, the people in the Jewish community. This is uncalled for. This is abhorrent. We need to stop all of this madness, and that's why we need a ceasefire. So, a uh, couple things. Maybe I'm just gonna I'm gonna be more practical with y'all. Let's figure out how to respond to some pushback uh, that I've found that's been resonating. There are a lot. Of, there's a lot of expertise here. So uh, take what you will, and there's probably some other arguments that I'm I'm gonna leave out. But I'm just letting you know how we've been responding uh, on the Hill to some of these pushbacks. So one, we did cover this already, or I did cover this already, you know, cessation of hostilities versus ceasefire to us. That's the same thing. If folks say we want an immediate and unconditional cessation of hostilities and, a, and a, you know, or a ceasefire, that's moving in the right direction. If they say short term or temporary, to us, that's not enough. We need to actually get them to call for an end to the violence. And we've already discussed why a humanitarian pause is just not enough. Uh, people need medical treatment and they need to make sure while they're healing that a bomb doesn't go off near their house or on their house. Full stop. That's pretty common sense. Um, another thing I mentioned is that Hamas and Israel have already agreed to ceasefires in the past including in 2021, 2014, and, and, and even further back. They've done this time and time again. We've, we've done it before. We can do it again. Uh, nearly 300 Palestinians were killed this year before October 7. Does that also not count as violating a ceasefire? 
So the idea that the ceasefire was violated on October 7 is something that we have a, a lot of bandwidth and, and a lot of ground to push back on. And I suggest that we do that. Another thing we hear, a ceasefire will only help Hamas. I say, no, that's not true. <laughs> a ceasefire is critical to prevent the spread of extremism. Every time you kill a child of someone or a father or a mother, you are spreading hate. That's what you're doing. You're spreading, uh, you know, you know, the seeds of what's going to turn into uh, more hate. We cannot do this. So if you're creating, you know, you know, more extremism through every bombing, through every killing, you're actually not undermining, uh, you know, Hamas. You're actually emboldening extremism. And, uh, you know, you cannot bomb an ideology out of existence. It just can't happen. I'm someone coming here to you that has some personal experience with this. My cousin uh, was, you know, killed by ISIS. Uh, let's just say it in Syria. Uh, it, it was just absolutely horrific. And, you know, and I blame the Iraq war for it. I blame our policy in Syria that's sowing the seeds of this kind of you know hatred and and causing uh, you know regional instability through our regime change wars and our sanctions and our brutal policies in the Middle East for decades. And so the way to address that, the way to actually you know do what's right is to start fixing the core issues that under, underlie why people can be you know can go down the path of radicalization. Full stop. Um, and I, one thing I just say, this is something the Quakers say a lot, is war is not the answer, period. That's, that's one of the best ways I think you can, you can uh, you know, defend your response. Okay, so is it possible to do a ceasefire? I already mentioned that. Another thing we keep hearing is that we have no leverage with the Israelis and they're gonna do this anyway. And I say, we have a lot of leverage. We are selling weapons. We are about to approve a $14.5 billion supplemental to fund this war. Don't tell us we don't have leverage. We're not putting the full diplomatic weight behind what we can do. And, and that to me is the key. Also, it's worth noting that the Israeli Air Force, just like the Saudi Air Force, depends on the regular transfer of spare parts and maintenance to keep these warplanes in the air. Those could be turned off today and completely stop a, a lot of what we're seeing right now. So don't tell us we don't have leverage. Also, no ceasefire without the hostages. You keep hearing that. But airstrikes are putting the hostages at risk. The ground invasion is putting the hostages at risk. The blockade is putting the hostages at risk. And we need to support diplomacy. We, we cannot bomb our way in bringing them back. Uh, you know, it, it's absolutely absurd. We're 99% of everyone that's died in the past five weeks have been civilians and only a few dozen actual Hamas fighters. This is not a war against Hamas. This is a war against civilians, full stop. Um, so what happens after is another thing like, you know, we can't have a ceasefire. What happens after? My answer to that is we can't know what happens after while this is unfolding. You've got Israeli ministers calling for the nuclear, a, a nuclear attack on Gaza. You've got some saying that, no, we're not going to be in Gaza uh, after this war. And some are saying, actually, yeah, we plan to indefinitely occupy Gaza. So we can't even have that conversation yet. And that's why we need a ceasefire right now so we can pick up the pieces and try to, as best as we can, move forward with peace, human rights, and, and dignity for Palestinians. Um, so I'm, I'm going to uh, wrap up pr pretty soon here. I'm, again, so grateful for the opportunity to chat here. Again, we are asking everybody to take action, you know, be in the streets, call your members, email your members, schedule visits, write an op-ed, write an LTE, do all the things. Uh, we've set up fcnl.org backslash deescalate as one potential tool among many. We've also set up the line 1833-STOP-WAR. And that's a way that you can just automatically get connected to your rep and two senators. Or if you live in DC, your rep. Um, we have to change that too, speaking of injustices. So 
I want to close by centering the voices of children. We recently got an email at FCNL from the headmaster of the Ramallah Friend School with some prayers from their students who are deeply disturbed by the violence in Gaza and who say they don't want to go to school until kids in Gaza can go to school. And that is just enough to break your heart. Um, from a second grader, I wish I could share my flashlight with the people in Gaza so they can see when their power goes out. I wish I could give everyone in Gaza a mattress to sleep on. I wish I could give everyone in Gaza water that is clean for drinking and enough food to eat. I pray kids will be safe in Gaza. From an eighth grader. I pray that this war will end through nonviolence because violence never solves anything. I also pray that as a global community, we will make a difference by donating water, food, and crucial medical supplies so that every single person in Gaza can have their basic needs met. And I pray that this war will end now. And thank you so much, Jihad, for having me on. Thank you so much, Hassan. Thank you, Aya. Thank you, Josh. Um, we really appreciate your input, your input and, and your valuable contributions. Um, I have some questions from the audience, uh, and I have one question from me, um, and it's it's a general slash abstract question that deals with the state of the U.S. political system um, as we experience this this crisis. Um, and it's a question for all for the three of you. Uh, we're we're witnessing a situation where every healthy aspect of what makes a political system healthy uh, being suspended due to this uh, U.S. rush uh, to be on Israel's side. No checks or balances. Uh, First Amendment is at risk. Freedom of expression is at risk. Um, the the voices of U.S. voters and taxpaying citizens and residents aren't be aren't being taken into consideration. So this is dangerous, not just for Palestinians, but also for the for the health of the political system here in the United States. Is there a threshold? where in which lawmakers and politicians would say this is dangerous this is affecting every aspect of what makes a political system healthy and are we also at risk here uh, by being silenced and criminalized and smeared just for um, standing up to injustice and pushing for what is humane and what is right. Maybe I could take a stab at this. This is deeply destabilizing to the United, United States. You know, you are seeing a rise in hate uh, and you're also seeing, you know, groups like APAC support folks that supported the January 6th attacks on our capital. Uh, this is definitely, you know, and it's going to have, you know, a reverberation across, uh, you know, all of our different elections, you know, all the way, uh, you know, from, you know, state, local, federal, and um, buckle up because, you know, this is a deeply destabilizing moment. And as these, you know, call, I don't, I don't see the call for ceasefire going away. I think it's just going to pick up steam and continue uh, you know, and, and that's good, uh, but lawmakers that are continually, you know, not representing the views of their people can, you know, create other problems that, you know, that we have. Something I didn't mention in my comments is another tactic that I haven't seen explored uh, too publicly, and it's something that I would just urge people consider doing. If your member is not on a, the ceasefire res or hasn't called for a ceasefire, you know, speaking of engaging in our democratic system, I think you should primary challenge them and get your friends together, raise some money and actually say single issue. Uh, you know, if you're not going to represent us on ceasefire that, you know, maybe you should not no longer represent us at all. Uh, so I think this is one tool in the toolbox that I think we should seriously consider as a movement.
Josh, Aya. Aya, do you want to go? Um, sure. I was just gonna say, I think you see this on on two ends. Um, on on one end, it's dangerous globally, right? The way that our administration is responding is can undermine everything that we've ever worked for in terms of relationships worldwide, right? I think we're really undermining ourselves as a country. Like the world, honestly speaking, views us as a joke. Nobody's taking us seriously anymore. Uh, world governments are not taking us seriously anymore. Even though we continuously try to praise ourselves as the best democracy in the world. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, I think the most disturbing thing that this is showing from our government is that it this our institutions have truly been built for the white man, right? And since the establishment of these institutions, there's only been band-aids placed to kind of make them conform or build them up to represent us right to to represent the diversity band-aids nothing has ever been reinstitutionalized and i think from the pandemic era from 2021 what we saw unfold with uh, blm and gaza until now i think this the dysfunction of our system has been unraveling and now it's at a faster pace than ever um i would echo uh representative uh, cory bush's statements of no longer being surprised that the same chamber that is trying to silence Palestinians, to deport us, to call us terrorists, to silence the only Palestinian American in Congress, uh, to literally call for our annihilation is the same institution that enabled slavery. And the only other person that was actually censured was a man who brought forth an anti-slavery bill. And I think that that speaks so much to our, our institution and how that in 2023, we actually are not as progressive as we claim ourselves to be. But on the other end, I think that this is a po positive in some sorts and that the American public has woken up. The American public is no longer um, taking the lies of our elected officials to hush us. There's so many people that outside of like me, Josh, Hassan, our organizations who are very conscious of everything that's happening on a daily basis, it's now trickled into the actual American public who are no longer like believing this facade of we're doing this for, for the good or that, you know, the, the, that Democrats are the lesser of two evils, that, that, that threshold has been broken, I believe. And I think that like Hassan said, this is going to have an a grave impact on elections because the younger generation now is is taking over. There's going to be a whole new generation of people that are going to vote in 2024. And that is going to impact our country's trajectory like never before. And even if there are members of Congress or any elected officials on any level that are reelected, that have really poor views right now, even if they're calling for humanitarian pause, which like my colleague said before me, is literally not enough in is literally saying we're going to feed Palestinians until we kill them. That's what, what a humanitarian pause is saying. Even if these people are reelected, they are going to continue to feel the pressure because of the fact that there has been this mass shift within American public opinion. And our people have woken up. And there is no longer the propaganda wars that Israel and the U.S. have long upheld. They've lost them. And so... I think while we're seeing the negativity of everything right now, I do think there's a positive shift that's coming in that we are no longer going to take the BS pretty much. I definitely agree with Aya. I think it's very much now the emperor who has no clothes type of moment where the realities are becoming quite obvious and evident to so many people in this country. Right after the House voted to give $14.3 billion in weapons to Israel last week, I tweeted something to that effect, that this was deepening our complicity in Israel's genocidal actions toward Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. And that tweet was seen 35 million times by people. And there were so many tens of thousands of comments that I got saying, 
how is it possible that we have $14 billion to give weapons to Israel to commit these atrocities against Palestinians, but we don't have money for health care. We don't have money to house people in this country. People are going bankrupt because they don't have health care. And it is just an insane expression of what the priorities of this government are to be funding these genocidal actions and not taking care of people's human needs both here and around the globe. Now, let me make three quick points to Jihad's question. Number one, I'm gonna shamelessly steal from my colleague, Lara Friedman, the president of the Foundation for Middle East Peace. When she talks about the attempts to constrain and repress and attempt to outlaw, and even in some cases criminalize support for Palestinian rights in this country, as that being a canary in the coal mine. And what she means by that is that these attempts, which have been made, and let's not forget the fact that Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland just a few years ago introduced a bill, the Israel Anti-Boycott Act, in the Senate of the United States to throw in jail for 20 years people who provide information to the UN support to support a nonviolent boycott of Israel. Can you imagine that? Going to jail for 20 years because you support a nonviolent boycott for Palestinian rights. This is what our elected officials are proposing in Congress. So when Lara talks about this being the canary in the coal mine, what she means is that the templates for these state laws that have been passed to deny people uh, the right to contract with the state or to uh, divest from any organization that supports divesting from Israel, these same laws are being used as a template to suppress freedom of speech for Black Lives Matter, for divesting from oil interests, and for a clean energy future. So yes, the steps that members of Congress are taking to undermine our First Amendment rights to speak on behalf of Palestinian rights has devastating implications for our ability to speak and organize and be in any semblance of a democracy without exaggeration. And look what happened to Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib on Tuesday night. They censured her for a thought crime. This is straight out of George Orwell, 1984. They censured her for daring to believe that Israelis and Palestinians should live together in freedom and democracy and equality in one state between the river and the sea which has been her consistent position since before she was elected to the Congress of the United States. When you can censure elected members of Congress for a thought crime, the consequences to the notion of even having freedom of speech and democracy in this country are shaken to its core. Now, third, let me say this, the so-called Anti-Defamation League, and I say so-called because it's only, it's only reason for being in existence is to defame anyone who speaks on behalf of Palestinian rights. You can go there and look at my long profile there. And I agree with every word I said on that profile, by the way. The ADL now has asked more than 100 universities to investigate students for justice in Palestine chapters on their campus for material support of terrorism. The ADL is taking steps to throw people into jail as other people have been thrown into jail under material support for their advocacy on campus on behalf of Palestinian rights. If pro-Israel organizations believe that college students should be brought up on material support for terrorism charges to advocating for Palestinian rights. This shows you the degree to which the Israel lobby will go to suppress these voices because there is no answer. There is no response to Israel's genocidal actions. There's no pretext. There's no justification that allows for the perpetuation of the ongoing Nakba after 75 years. So as Israel's genocidal actions toward the Palestinian people intensify, so will these efforts to silence all of our voices, 
with dire implications for all of us. Thank you so much, Josh. Uh, our colleague Saeed Redekat has a question for the panel. But I just want to highlight that uh, uh, Columbia University suspended uh, Students for Justice in Palestine and Jewish Vo Voice for Peace chapters as we were having this conversation. Uh, Saeed, the floor is yours. Very, very, very quickly to actually to Hassan, uh, I wanted to ask you, could we somehow publish uh, the figures, the numbers that uh, people get from APAC and other lobby groups? And I, the reason I ask this because uh, Richie Torres, you know, the congressman uh, from New York, it was published how much he got and so on. Now, I know these guys uh, are addicted to APAC money. Uh, a lot of them are. You know, there may be a couple dozen ideological zealots for Israel in, in Congress and the Senate, but no more than that, really. So I think what we ought to do is begin, you know, I'm not saying name and shame, but actually say it. The, this guy is getting this much from this. Is there a way of doing this for all members who are getting it? Thank you. Yeah, uh, there certainly is. That's all public data uh, on the FEC site. So you can look it up. You know, I've certainly looked before I do a lobby meeting. Sometimes I do check to see where they're getting their money. Uh, the power of APAC, though, is not just about money. And, and that's something I wanted to stress. They have, uh, you know, there's a network of thousands of legal professionals hundreds of organizations that work in collaboration and me social media influencers. Um, and I, I do think we need to be aware of what we are up against um, and, uh, you know, and, and plan and organize accordingly. And I do think taking into account, you know, the fundraising needed to actually protect our allies like Rashida Tlaib and other members that have called for a ceasefire and be able to launch credible primary challenges uh, to people that don't support Palestinian human rights is a should be a huge goal of our movement uh, going forward. And I think the money and the fundraising does exist. It's just, you know, I don't I haven't seen it sustained and really, you know, push forward in the way, uh, you know, that that I think we need. But this is a new opening. This is a new moment. And, you know, everything that, you know, has been said here kind of shows and speaks to the fact that, uh, you know, we are at a, a precipice of history and a, 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 a corner of history uh, where we can choose to go in a different direction where we build and sustain more power. And I'll just say we don't need to raise dollar for dollar because the American people are with us. 80% want a ceasefire. Only 3% support what APAC is pushing right now, you know, in, in the general public. Uh, but it's going to be a, a really tough organizing effort. Thank you, Hassan. We have a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to uh, address some of them because of time. And of course, uh, you know, we, uh, the speakers are accessible and, and Hassan, I see that Hassan is typing an answer for one of the questions. So thank you, Hassan. Um, there is a question about uh, what needs to be done uh, with, locally within communities beyond the Beltway. Um, and I think this is important also because not everyone is in DC and a lot of people, you know, are, uh, live far away from centers of decision making. So if you, um, you know, Aya, Hassan and Josh, if you could say a few things about what can be done uh, locally uh, from, from, uh, from other states and within other communities. Sure, I can, I can offer. So I think a lot of people, when it comes to Palestine advocacy, most people focus on Congress, which is should be the high level focus, considering that's where all the funding is passed through. However, state and local elected officials are super sneaky when it comes to being pro-Israel. I'm going to tell you why. Most anti-BDS legislation is not passed through federal, uh, through the Congress. It's passed actually in state and local uh, by state and local elected officials. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that many states actually have anti-BDS legislation. For example, I'm from Colorado. I live in DC, DC now. I worked in the Colorado uh, General Assembly for three years. While I was there, I was actually really curious to see if my state had passed anti-BDS law. And surely I went into the system and I just put anti-BDS and I found 
a piece of legislation that was passed in 2017 um, that would essentially target some kind of one of our health insurances, which is crazy. And if you go and look through most states, they have them. I mean, last year, most of our organizations were working against a uh, increase of trying to get anti-BDS legislation passed. Um, also, the, we're talking about schools, so institutions trying to censor students. Um, I was just reading about a 13-year-old Palestinian boy that was just suspended because he uh, was called a terrorist and just responded with free Palestine, and they suspended him. They didn't sp suspend the kid that called him a terrorist. They suspended the boy who said free Palestine. And so... There is so much that you can do. Pay attention. Right now, there's been so many uh, city councils across the country that have, there have been a few that have been really good and have been calling for ceasefires, but the rest have been calling or standing in support of Israel and mimicking congressional level resolutions that stand in support of Israel. So you want to pay attention to your city councils to your state general assemblies, to your school boards, because that's where they're the sneakiest when it comes to being uh, pro-Israel and trying to get pro-Israel initiatives uh, passed. Thank you, Aya. Hassan uh, or Josh, do you have anything to add or? Okay. Um, uh, there, there is a question about which uh, I personally heard uh, during congressional visits and in talking to journalists about how can Palestinians be trusted with a ceasefire, um, and I think I think I mean you guys are, are are also experts, but I think you know historically uh, most ceasefires have been violated by the Israeli side. Uh, but uh, how do you deal with this question uh, on the hill and beyond and? What do you say to this point? And I won't, I won't select who gets to start talking first, so feel free to. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Look, historically, you can go back to 1948 and the UN saying that it was Israel that repeatedly broke the many ceasefires that the UN tried to impose to stop the Nakba from occurring. So yes, there's this long history of Israel being the one to, to break ceasefires, but you know, I think what needs to happen is a ceasefire. And as Hassan mentioned, every single previous round of fighting between Israel and Hamas, has resulted in a ceasefire. And that's the only conceivable way this one can end as well. So, you know, in terms of trust, trust is a two-way street for sure. Uh, but I wanna take the opportunity posed by this question to say that I don't think that there is a going back to the status quo of before October 7th. You know, and I've been thinking, I've been thinking this and I know this might sound pretty pretty far out there, but I'm just going to say it anyway, because I think it needs to be said. Israel has destroyed, as we talked about, more than half of the housing units of Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, three quarters of whom are refugees. Why rebuild in Gaza? Let's just, let's just end the 75 years of oppression right now, and let's have the Palestinian refugees who have been sitting in refugee camps in the Gaza Strip for the last 75 years go now and exercise their right to return to their homes and their properties, which the UN promised them they could do 75 years ago. What is the point of dragging out this oppression any longer? What is the use of pretending that all we need is another ceasefire? We need much more than just a ceasefire. We need justice, we need freedom, we need equality, we need self-determination for the Palestinian people, and we need the Palestinian refugees to be enabled to exercise their internationally guaranteed right to return home. Enough. I think October 7th definitely was a transformative date in the history of Palestine-Israel. So let this be a transformative moment towards justice and peace. I would just like to add to uh, and reiterate the fact that the families of the Israeli hostages are calling for a ceasefire. If the families of the Israeli hostages understand the necessity of a ceasefire, 
then our own government should understand it as well. But again, it speaks a lot to the allegiance that it pays to Israel and honestly to the fact that a lot of these elected officials probably do want to see the annihilation of Palestinians because if the very families of the Israeli hostages and thousands of Israelis are blaming Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, for what is happening right now and not blaming Hamas, that says everything that we need to know about the Israeli government. So I would, my response now is exactly that. And, and that happened two days ago. We had another Hill Day and I got some questions from staffers and that was my response, is if the Israeli hostages' families are going on live TV and calling for a ceasefire and holding Netanyahu accountable, that tells you everything that you need to know. You know, and this is also one of those times where it's okay to lean on validators. You say every international humanitarian is calling for a ceasefire because they need to get aid in. They are the experts at delivering humanitarian assistance. They are telling us that a pause is is inadequate and, and not going to you know solve the needs. So if you know you can you know when you're getting those kind of questions, you can kind of say, well you know don't take it from me. Take it to the people that are actually trying to make sure that children you know get the medical treatment that they need. And right now we need to save as many children as possible and as many families as possible. So that would, you know, in addition to what my, my colleagues uh, said, I, I would also lean on some of the validators that have been speaking out because they they're articulating great reasons for an immediate ceasefire. Thank you so much all. And uh, you also answered another question about what is beyond the call for a ceasefire. Uh, and I really appreciate addressing all these points. And with that, uh, Jihad, yes, I, yes. Really quickly, someone, I think Gretchen asked a question. I just wanted to maybe just answer verbally because I didn't want uh, people to misunderstand what I what I said in my original comments. Um, you know, they, they, she said, uh, you know, do folks agree with Hassan that we need to wait and see what happens next? I think we need to keep up the pressure and have a vision for the future that centers Palestinian human rights. What I was referring to about my comment that we can't really, you know, know what happens next was around like who governs Gaza after Hamas is defeated. Um, and, 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 you know, those are the questions we're getting on the Hill. And for me, I, you know, what happens next really depends on what's going on now. And so Maybe others wanted to speak to that, but we need to be steadfast and clear that we, you know, only will accept uh, a future that, you know, centers the dignity of Palestinians, uh, you know, with self-determination, human rights, uh, and, and that's the way we need to move forward. And, you know, that requires safety for everybody, you know, bottom line, that needs to be the, the common denominator. But I just, you know, I was just referring to a lot of offices are saying, okay, well, what are we doing one state? We're doing two states. Are we going to have UN peacekeeping forces there? Um, you know, I have thoughts on that, but really we need to have a ceasefire and then, you know, bring, uh, bring people together uh, for an international, like, you know, dialogue about how to proceed. But we cannot, we cannot have that conversation in good faith right now as Palestinian families are being slaughtered. That, that was kind of the point I was trying to make, and I hope that was clear. Thank you so much, Hassan. I uh, really appreciate it. And with that, I'm, I'm uh, aware that there are a lot of questions. Dr. Ali, uh, you're, you're muted, though. While, while we're waiting for him, I want to thank the panelists for wonderful presentations. At the end of the day, you know, all uh, we as Palestinians and peace activists want is peace and justice. And uh, a just peace is the only way to avoid these escalations and loss of life. And everybody knows what a just resolution uh, would look like. So... With that, I thank you again, and I'll uh, see if Dr. Ali can chime in, can chime in with his uh, concluding remarks. 
Yes, before I go to the concluding remarks, the discussion over the last 15 minutes, can you hear me now? Yes. Good. Uh, actually, remind me of a booklet that I've read many times, which is this, and a lot of you have been advocating speaking up. This is Who Knows Better Must Say So. And it's a 1955 booklet by Rabbi Dr. Elmer Berger, one of the best booklets that I have ever read and over and over and over. For those who may be interested, it's 100 pages and it is as relevant today and to what I've been listening for the, literally for the last uh, hour as anything else. Uh, sounds like Josh may have read it, but uh, it's a wonderful booklet and it is, it's a, it's a precious uh, guide to what we should uh, be doing today. Let me go to concluding remarks. I think that the three panels that just concluded, NECBA at 75, Oslo at 30, and US policy today, which we have just enjoyed, presented a thorough picture of the theme of our conference for today for our annual meeting, which is One Palestine, the struggle against apartheid. The panelists actually did a fantastic job in covering their assigned subjects. And uh, even though the program was written and prepared much earlier than uh, what's going on right now in Gaza, it presented a full coverage of today's picture. Uh, I know that uh, I've listened that uh, you want to conclude the program, but the discussion is wonderful. And if there are, there are, there is time. If there are any questions that the panelists have or uh, thoughts, I think we can extend the time. But if there isn't, I would like to thank our moderators and panelists, and certainly our staff at the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center for doing such an excellent job that resulted in today's successful conference. Jihad, do you have any thoughts um, to conclude just... this uh, meeting? Yes, I'm, I'm really grateful uh, for our presenters, moderators, for uh, Dr. Ali, Dr. Mustafa, uh, Dr. Uh, Gharib, uh, and, and Saeed, and everyone here, all the presenters who joined us today. Um, and as Dr. Ali said, this has been in planning for months. We did not anticipate that we would have this conversation during such a horrific moment. And, uh, and I think even under difficult circumstances like the one we're witnessing, there is always a need for, uh, uh, for conversations that uh, ground us, that uh, enable us to reflect on the past, the present, and the future, uh, while inspired by uh, the wisdom and knowledge of those who uh, have, have studied and understood and worked on uh, this issue for decades and dedicated their lives. So again, I'm, I'm grateful for, uh, for all of you. And um, I'm also grateful for the attendees uh, who stuck with us since uh, 9 a.m. Eastern. So thank you all for your dedication and for being part of the conversation. And as someone whose family is in Gaza, I'm grateful for the work of uh, this, uh, the members of this panel. Uh, these people are on the front lines of advocacy and awareness raising on the hill and beyond. And without, without their efforts, uh, I personally don't know where we would be right now. So thank you all. And um, and this is uh, all I have. Uh, Dr. Ali, thank you for the opportunity to uh, to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, this concludes our, uh, doc let me go to Dr. Mustafa. Dr. Mustafa, you have any final thoughts? 
No, I, I echo what you and Jihad said, thanking everybody. And I believe that this program will be on our website for those who did not have the time to see it during a work day, to view it and learn from it, uh, as I certainly did. My final thought is that the title of the program was One Palestine, the Struggle Against Apartheid. But the uh, discussion today that dominated the uh, presentations of the current genocide, of course, was inevitable. And I think that the panelists all through the day did a, an excellent job in uh, handling that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you Thank all. You. Outstanding. Thank you all. Thank you.